a very good morning to all of you. On the outset, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to each one of you assembled here. You have responded very generously to our invitation. You have left aside many other interests and have heeded to our request to be with us. I also want to thank the MC, Sinai Shishur, as well as Professor Rashmi Naskar, her team members for organizing this function this morning. I want to specially mention two of my good, I think I should call them friends, Bashirjit Mandol and Somo. I don't know whether Somo is here. Hi, he's there. Professors of the Economics Department of Bishya Bharati for always extending their generous hands whenever we needed them and asked for their assistance and guidance. This, in fact, for us is an auspicious occasion since all of us have gathered together on this special day. I think most of you must have received this booklet, but I won't request you to open the pages to read. You can close it down. I may not read it as it is, but I want to highlight some of the significant aspects and characteristics and factors of Brahma Bandhu Bhatiyai. When I read the book that was published by Julius Lipner, Julius Lipner did his PhD on Brahma Bandhu Bhatiyai. And he published his thesis from the Oxford University. So when that book came to Kutal's library at St. Xavier's College, and I happened to be the director of the library, I read the book, and it is there I took interest in this man. His life deeply touched me. There were two extremes. One, he was an ascetic. He was a spiritual person. He was oriented divinely. And the other, the other extreme, he was a political thinker. And as some people say, he was the first freedom fighter in this country. The one who raised his voice against the foreign rule. And so since I took interest in this man, and his characters impressed me very much, I began researching, because I am not a researcher like Julius Lipner on this man, but I did a little research and started writing about him on various aspects of his life. And then we built up a small library in his memory of all the publications on the life and works of Swami Brahmabandhu uh, Vatiyayam. You know, the decade 1860s, when in fact the agitation, there was this Santal Hul. Santal Hul was the first agitation against the British rule. We very often forget that because it was done by Santals. 30,000 Santals died in that agitation. About 65,000 Santals participated in that agitation. And it was directly against the British rule. And that's why hundreds of Santals were hung on the trees and they died for a cause of this country, which goes unnoticed in the history of this country. And so 1860s, followed by, of course, this incident, this happened. 1860s, that decade was a blessing to West Bengal, you know. Because during that decade, many great men were born. born. Brahma Bandha in 90, 1861. And his contemporaries, Swami Vivekananda. 
Rabindranath Tagore and the great scientist Jagdish Chandra Bose. So these were the men who were born in 1860s and including St. Xavier's College. And good number of them were students of St. Xavier's College. Swami Vivekananda was a student of Scottish Church College. And Jagdish Chandra Bose was a student of St. Xavier's. And Rabindranath Tagore was a student of St. Xavier's. And Brahmavadabhadhyaya was very closely associated with the Jesuits of St. Xavier's, though he was not a student. And so I take this as a privilege to share with you some of my reflections, some of my, the results of my research on this great soul. See, Brahmavadabhadhyaya was a theologian. He was editor of at least three journals and they were controversial journals. He was a revolutionary. He was a nationalist leader. He was a philosopher. Born in February, he called himself a Hindu Catholic. He was arrested on September 10th 1907 on charge of sedition. Brahmabandhu was a contemporary to Swami Animanando, his close friend, and also a friend of Rabindranath Tagore and Swami Vivekananda. He, along with Animananda, started the school in Bolpur here yeah, right away. In 1901, on the request of Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore. So, what it is today, the seed was planted by three of them Rabindranath Tagore, Brahmavandhu Bhatiai, and Animanando. And Animanando was the first teacher of this place. And so, I shall share with you. And before that, as I was talking to some of you, one of them mentioned to me, Father, why not start besides this annual Christmas lecture, a lecture in memory of Swami Animan, uh, uh, Swami Brahmabandhu Bhatiyai. We shall have an annual memorial lecture in this place either on his birth anniversary or death anniversary. I think we should do that. So we would have... Yes, sir. Snash you, sir. Shall we? Yes. So I think we could have two lectures. One, the annual Christmas lecture, and then the other, an annual uh, memorial lecture. We could arrange it twice a year. If acceptable, of course, to the community, we shall definitely do it. Rabindranath Tagore described Brahma Bandhavadhyay as a Roman Catholic ascetic and yet a Vedantin. Tagore said, is a man who is spirited, fearless, self-denying, learned, and uncommonly influential, Christian and Hindu, holy man and savant, a prophet and a revolutionary. He was a paradoxical figure who played a key role in the struggle for independence. Alongside Swami Vivekananda, Rabindranath Tagore, Aurobindo Ghosh, and others. His fiery convictions and passionate rhetoric won him many admirers, but branded him as a dangerous revolutionary in the eyes of the British colonial establishment. He was an ardent nationalist who died while under arrest for sedition on October 27th, 1907. His life can be divided into five periods, five stages. 
I call it his early life, which I will touch upon some aspects of his life from 1861 to 1881. The second period as a Hindu reformer from 1881 to 1890. And the third as a Christian witness from 1891 to 1901. And as a missionary abroad, not in India, from 1902 to 1903. And finally, the fifth stage as a nationalist leader from 1904 to 1907. If Subhas Chandra Bose is considered today as a forgotten hero, Brahmabandhu Bhatiai is a forgotten prophet of India's search for nationhood and modernity. He was born a Brahmin as Bhavani Charan and that was his original name. He was a new Bengali middle class, educated, upper caste Hindu. Yet his conversion to Roman Catholicism and his revolutionary ideas for merging Christian doctrines with an Indian idiom marked him as an exceptional person. Brahmabandha was a fiery patriarch from an early stage. Under the influence of Kesab Chandra Sen, he joined the Brahma Samaj and went to Sindh to preach his new faith. But in Sindh, he met Reverend Kali Charan Banerjee, under whose influence he was converted to Christian faith. On February 26, 1891, Reverend Heaton, a clergyman of the Church of England, baptized him. But soon, Brahmabandho decided not to attend the church services on the ground that he did not belong to the Church of England because we were under the British rule. In September 1891, he was again baptized by a Jesuit priest, Father Bruder, at Karachi and became a Catholic. His conversion was followed by a number of others and so created a storm in Sindh. He chose the name of Theophilus as his patron saint, whom he called Brahmabandha. Theophilus is a Greek name, Greek word, which means lover of God. And Brahmabandha means lover of God. He took this name because St. Theophilus is famous ecclesiastical hero because he is the one who coined the word Trinity, the triune God, that is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And so Bhavani Charan took that liking to that triune dimension of God and began singing the praises of this triune God. And he called it Sat Chit Anand. His Catholic faith did not denationalize him, but rather brought him into closer and closer relationship with Hindu Samaj day by day. Influenced by Swami Vivekananda, he retraced his steps back to Hinduism, to propagate Vedanta in the West and to enlist the sympathies of the European servants to his cause. He travelled to Europe in 1902. He gave a series of lectures on Hindu faith. He wanted to win over the authorities of the church to his side. He said, if Europe could be made to pay homage to Hindu thought, why not India to Christian message? He visited Rome and made his general confession. He knelt down at the shrine of St. Peter's and St. Paul and set up a fervent prayer for the whole of India. In England, he met Cardinal Wagen and narrated to him the tale of pent-up sorrows of years. The Cardinal was touched and gave him permission 
to ventilate his ideas in the tablet magazine which is published from England. Brahma Bandhav had carried a letter of recommendation from His Grace the Archbishop of Calcutta which read, We declare that Brahma Bandhav Theophilus, a Brahmin of Calcutta, is a true Catholic of good character, burning with zeal to preach the good news of God all over the world. He started a monthly called Catholic Journal, Sophia. And Sophia is a Greek word that means wisdom. In 1896, and dedicated it to the honor of St. Francis Xavier, the patron saint of both the church and India. He wanted it to be an honored instrument in carrying out his glorious works for the freedom of this country and welfare of Indian people. I want to quote here Professor K.P. Alize. Professor K.P. Alize was a professor of philosophy, history at Bishop's College, Kolkata. I quote, Brahma Bandhubhatiya was the first national leader to demand total independence for India from the British rule. He was also the first to envisage a union between Hinduism and Christianity. Unquote. Let me now touch upon the beginnings of this place. Bishya Bharati University, or you call it Santi Niketan, Bolpur. Brahma Bandhubhatiyai and his close friend Animanando founded Saraswat Ayotthana in the tradition of Vedas in Simla Street, where of course was Swami Vivekananda's birthplace. In 1900, their idea was to revive the ancient sacred tradition of Acharya and Shishya. There were 12 boys with Animananda as their first teacher. The boys sat on mats. They paid no fees. The teacher received no salary because knowledge could not be parted. It could not be sold and purchased. One morning, Rabindranath Tagore, who was then hailed by Ubatyai as the Vishwakabi, the world poet, visited the new school and Brahmabandha himself received the honored guest. Tagore was highly pleased with the school. Later, Brahmabandha visited Santiniketan on the invitation of Rabindranath Tagore. The vast fields, the huge sal trees, and the quiet abode captivated him. With Tagore's request, Ubatyai, who called Tagore then Gurudev, decided to ship the school from Simla Street to Shantiniketan to open an ashram with Animanando as the teacher. Tagore, known as Rabi Babu. He himself received Animanando and his 12 boys at Bolpur in December 1901. Tagore's two sons, Ratindranath and Samindranath, joined the other boys in the school. Animanando did not like the whole idea of going to Bolpur. First, he refused that he would miss the Sunday Mass, Sunday Eucharistic celebration, because there was no church here and there was no Sunday worship celebrations. So he said it was very difficult for him to sacrifice the Sunday Eucharist. But then, Prabhavandu told him, every Sunday you can go back to Kolkata, attend Sunday service and come back. On that condition, he agreed that he would teach the boys in Bolpur. The generous welcome of the poet, that is Rabindranath Tagore, and the free atmosphere which 
he created for them removed all hesitancy for Animanando and Animanando put his heart and soul in his new mission to teach the 12 boys. That was the beginning of today's Bolpur, Vishyavarati, Shantiniketan. But this wonderful collaboration between these three great men, between a poet and a philosopher, was not to meant last. Brahmabandha's political sentiments proved too strong to allow him to remain for long at Shantiniketan. His and Animananda's connection with the school at Shantiniketan ceased about a year after its starting. Let's now move on to Brahmabandha Upadhyaya's some contributions. The main contribution of Upadhyaya to Indian Christian theology lies in his explanation of the Christian doctrine of Trinity. That is Satchit Anand and the doctrine of creation as Maya. God the Father is Sat being and the Son is the Chit that is consciousness or intelligence and the Spirit is Ananda joy of fulfillment. This vision comes through a beautiful Sanskrit hymn which we heard in the beginning. That is Bande Satchidanandama Bande. I bow to him who is being, consciousness and bliss. Which he composed and then he sang. And as Sinaishis said, Father Antoine, of course, gave the tune, the music, and it was sung in 1964 in Mumbai at the International Eucharistic Congress. And today it is being sung in every, in every Christian church all over India. Ubatyai's Swadeshi was altogether different. His political sentiments proved too strong to allow him to remain in pure educational work. He was the first man in our political history to suggest a complete independence for India. And he wrote in his journal, Sandhya, I quote, I swear by the moon and the sun that I have heard in my heart this message of freedom, as the tree in winter gets new life, with the touch of the breeze of, of the spring, as you feel joy at the return of love, as the heart of a hero dances to the call of the trumpet of war, so a feeling has throbbed in my heart. But independence will, will mean both freedom from our slave complex and freedom from our gerrymandering politics." Unquote. And I quote again another version. Our minds have been conquered. We have become slaves. The faith in our own culture and the love of things Indian are gone. India will reach Swaraj the day she will again have a faith in herself. Ramakrishna had gone in that line. So did Bankim. So did Swami Vivekananda. The whole mass of our ancient, the whole mass of our people must now be made to appreciate things Indian and to return to our ancient ways. That is Swadesh opposite to Bidesh. Unquote. That is why he deprecated the begging attitude of Indians and proposed his Swaraj Gar. I quote, I see the fort of Swaraj built in our various places. There shall be no connection with foreigners. 
these forts will be purified by the incense of sacrifice resounding with a cry of victory filled to the overflowing with corn and grain unquote julius lipner one of the well known figure of course in oxford university who lived in india for some time he did his phd research on on brahmabandho and i want to quote him he said swami vivekananda lit the sacrificial flame revolution but brahmabandho upadhyay he fueled it safeguarded it and fanned the sacrifice and god writing a historically and theologically sensitive biography of ubatyai julius lipner gives a new perspective on the typical coordinates of bengali cultural identity lipner demonstrates forcefully that the issues with which brahmabandho grappled are still vitally important and merit sustained research and study i quote lipna ubatyai is one of the enigmas of modern india and a potential embarrassment to those who invoke him a religious reformer and a revivalist a self confessed catholic hindu political activist and a social commentator he is also difficult to categorize neatly perhaps for for these reasons there has been a tendency to relegate him to the shadows of modern indian history or to interpret him as a procrustean fashion i suppose a prophet like brahmabandho is less known because of his christian leanings or because he was a revolutionary he must be known and studied by all it is in the recent past that he is at least known in a very narrow circle of researchers lipner's work brahmabandho upadhyay the life and thought of a revolutionary is a rich and worthy contribution in this respect and i am confident this lecture as well as the attempts that we have made in the gotals library and the attempts that we make at st xavier's college and some of the jesuit institutions will initiate a process by which that the younger generation would take up to research on this great revolutionary and freedom fighter the gotals library as you would see in this booklet has made a collection of books and articles published both by brahmabandho upadhyay as well as on and about brahmabandho upadhyay and some of these publications has been listed in this book and we have also printed the hymn of prabhabandhu bhatia that is vande sachidanandam vande both in sanskrit as well as in english and so this lecture was meant of course to be a step to take it forward the research on this great freedom fighter on this very land where he came and spent almost a year with animanando and rabindranath tagore and then left for maybe a greater mission of fighting for the freedom of this country leaving aside his educational commitment and asking tagore to continue possibly that was the plan of god and so we pay our respect to this great soul and on this occasion we make a promise that the attempts that we make to do research to proclaim his message and to propagate what he stood for 
not only in terms of freedom for this country, but also in terms of understanding the relationship between Hindu faith and Christian faith. And that is what our aim. And I want to thank all of you for being present here to this lecture. And I'm sure we are open to some questions if you have. Thank you and God bless you all. That uh, what we think that our tradition, our greatest personalities, and at this place, a uh, companion of Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore and the person who named Gurudev as Vishwakovi is remembered by St. Xavier's University, Kolkata. This is just for you that it has been made possible. And we understand your research, but you are an economist and your economy of words are to be learned. Now the house is open for questions. Ladies and gentlemen, will you kindly introduce yourself? Prayag sir from St. Xavier's University. Pray if you might say research proposal, I'd like to see what you think. Uh, the question is actually um, about figures such as Brahmabandhu who tried to unify <coughs> Hinduism and Christianity. And I would like to know uh, how this could be done, or rather how a particular problem could be overcome, which is that Hinduism as a faith does not claim a monopoly on truth, in that it says, you know, Jato Pot, uh, Jato Mat, Tato Pot. Uh, whereas all the Abrahamic faiths, you know, Judaism, Islam, as well as Christianity, claim that theirs is the only God and only the worshippers of that God will reach salvation. So how do figures who are syncretistic figures like Brahmavandu try to negotiate that issue? So that is my question. And uh, the proposal, actually, Father, you may know that my own PhD research was on missionaries and their work with Hinduism to some extent, British administrators and missionaries. And Julius Libner is someone who read extensively. He has very good work on Hinduism as well. Uh, and uh, I was wondering what you would think of, maybe if I could initiate a research project, I could apply, uh, maybe even seek funding from the university to carry out. Because you've even identified the resources that are there in both hills and has the collection of books. So I don't know if you approve of this project. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't mention this, Brahmabandhu, because of his controversial stand on both uh, Catholicism as well as Hinduism, was not accepted on both sides. That's one of the reasons why he considered to be a failure, even in the Catholic Church. Many priests didn't accept him, because he was such a radical man, he wanted to bring these two together, and so Catholic Church said, as syncretic approach that our God is the only God. But that was an old approach. Today I think if you ask if you ask Pope himself has come forward to say, you see every religion is in itself is good. Every religion has its message. Every religion is the God's created religion. You cannot say yours is better than mine and mine is better than yours. I don't think. Each, each religion is unique in its own way. So Brahma Bandha took out this radical step and quite a few bishops didn't accept him. They said, your way is far ahead. We cannot accept your way. And so they didn't even. So on the one hand, he was not accepted by the church, the official church. On the other, he was also a revolutionary this side. So he wanted to bring Hinduism close to Catholicism and Catholicism, Christianity close to Hinduism. So this was his approach. And he was not accepted both sides. And maybe one of the reasons why he became a freedom fighter. And so this, this was the reality of his life. The second, of course, is definitely St. Davies University would be generously open eh, to accept your idea of research. If you take it up, you're most welcome. Go ahead. The university will be behind you. My wonderful speech. And the question that gentleman has just raised, I would like to point out if Upanishad, if you think of Upanishad, because with uh, 
Pramobandhu. Yeah, Pramobandhu. Pramobandhu was a Vedantin and he had great knowledge about the Vedas. Yes. And in the Vedas, in Upanishad, there is mention of only one God, Ekume Bhaditya, which is, you know, inscribed on the gate of uh, Vishwabharati. And so, question remains whether it's really difficult to combine Christianity with Hindu ideas. I don't think that they are much contradictory because we think, if you think about only one God, then there will be no contradiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, may I ask you whether you have thought about such um, great men who were fighters, and all great men are fighters. They fight for ideals, they fight for values, and ideals are something that are fast fading from our life. And value, values just mercilessly cut off from education. Education is becoming a mechanical process of imparting knowledge, but there is hardly any spirit or joy in the process of teaching or in the process of learning. This I have felt, which Gurudeva propagated specially was there should be joy in learning. But instead of this joy, it is becoming very, very mechanized. You are very and right. Brahmu Bandhu and other men of excellence who were here during the inception of uh, Brahmu Chajasu, they were specifically extraordinary teachers. But because they could inspire students to learn. They could give insight and they could uh, give them all sense of uh, honesty and as you have said, he was an ascetic. I do think these type of educationists are always ascetic. I think we all need to go back to the foundation and roots. I don't know whether we have still gurus, whether we have still acharyas. We have professors, we have teachers. The value system has changed. So I think we need to learn from these great fighters, from these great leaders. I think the foundational spirit has to come back to our life. Because we are considering education as a commercial commodity today. You see the mushroom, mushrooming of institutions. Every nook and corner you find a school where education is being sold and bought. Now what do you do? It has become a commodity and it's being done today in the market. And so that's where it is. And we need prophets like Brahma Bandha, prophets like Swami Vivekananda, the people who will take up the cause and fight it out. This is our mission. And that's one of the reasons, I suppose, we as academicians and intellectuals are gathered here to find the foundational roots whether our own mission could be prophetic, our own mission could be unique as teachers and as students. Who's on the teachings of uh, Father Griffiths? And can we Pete consider Griffiths. Pete Griffiths? How and uh, can we consider yeah. Father Griffiths as a kind of uh, and his ideas as an extension of what Brahmavandhu Father preached? Or and what, where does he come in to, in the context of yeah. the teachings of Brahmavandhu? Uh, Griffith, there have been hundreds of priests and Catholic lay people who have taken up this initiative of bringing Hinduism and Christianity together and living life. Now, Brahmabandha was a revolutionary prophet, but while Beat Griffith was ashramite, he had his own ashram, he invited people to make retreats, he followed a Hindu way of life, he was a sannyasi, 
and so that's what it is. But there are so many people in many places it has been there. And so on the one hand you find people of this type, prophetic. They want to bring these two religions together. You hardly find people and intellectually yes, academically yes, between Christianity and Islam. But spiritually and scripturally very much so many initiatives between Hinduism and uh, Christianity are taking place, yes. That's, yes, sir. Negotiation could take place. This negotiation did take place through this new definition of Brahma, which was being created uh, in the early uh, eight, uh, 19th century, which is a, a Western rationalist approach, which became popular through Western education. And uh, let's not also get and father also in his speech uh, made very clearly mention that he had connection with Keshav John the same for instance and it is to and they, 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 this whole idea of Brahma is in fact a monistic idea it is much above the particularities of the Hindu pantheon and that in fact is the point from where he can he can he can cross over to Christianity and such chit ananda. These are very monistic and these are Vedantic concepts, particularly of Shankara, and uh, in fact they are integral. And that's how actually he was trying to negotiate. <coughs> this can open up a wonderful discussion. Thank you for sure. agenda. First thing, I say selection of theme is top. <coughs> Last year he talked about Jesha and Kobi Guru. We talk about Harbour. We talk about Pugalda's death. Today, further step you have gone through. And I, why I will have to share? You should all clap because now this is much more important in our life to have a Pugalda's death. And I think, Professor, you deserve to be honored by everybody because I like to honor the tradition, but we should honor the present day also. If you understand that the present day, you will do better. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, you, you, you so Thank you. Thank you. I do not know much about Shantiketan or Vishwabhakti. He's a forgotten man. Although the spark, the fire that was in him, he had not only enriched Christianity or in particular religion, but as your father had mentioned, he was one of the earliest persons, maybe the first person, who provided the idea of boycott at a time when nobody had heard of these things. And finally, British. These are his ideas. But still, he remains a much underrated <laughs> man. Some of my co-listeners here have raised the same point. The synthesis of the Hinduism with the Christianity, we all know that and as father himself had mentioned, Ramakrishna, when he said Joto Moth, Toto Pot, he was suggesting the way to say Lipner. He had mentioned this in his book also, that he brought out a procession in the streets of Bombay, whom we call Nagar Sankirtan. The same thing we found in Chaitanya Dev, in the streets of Nadia. But in spite of that, um, proposals to take this forward and we welcome that. Yes, sir. Thank you. The situations of the political activists uh, in our country presently, they are put behind the bar. Uh, I would like to name one person, Arun Ferreira, who is one of my friends and participated in my PhD in such work on the issue of political, uh, sorry, uh, activist protection in India. Uh, now he is behind the bar in Bhima Koregao case. So I would like to know uh, what kind of adversaries uh, he faced, Upadha uh, faced, and how he encountered. Because I wish to use, or other activists wish to use that strategy as to how to encounter the adversaries. As you mentioned that he was also uh, prosecuted under section 124A, uh, that is sedition. So please enlighten me. Uh, to go into the if you are an activist, you have to face the situation. Because uh, if you want me to say, Jesus Christ himself was an activist and he had to face it. And the same way, when 
Brahmabandhu Bhatiai was arrested because he was against the British rule. And when he was in jail, he was asked, would you have a lawyer to fight for your case? He said, why should I? Because I have no case. You have put me behind the bars, you do what you want to do. And so he was, after some time, I think one of his friends took him out for medical reasons. And then he was brought back to the jail. And then he died in the jail. Yes. So he said, I'm not going to fight for it. I don't want a lawyer to fight for my case. Because you all know I have done nothing wrong. I only raised my voice against what is going on. This is what it is. So if you are taking up a mission of an activist, if you are fighting against injustice, fighting against corruption, fighting against rules, this is the way we have to face. And so it happens. So the, yeah, the, no, the question is, university is a public institution. It cannot take sides. It can't take any side, whether the political side or an institutional side, because you are teaching students. If you take, take, if you start taking sides, and you are teaching the students to take sides, so you need to be very careful. Not that you cannot stand for justice, not that you cannot stand for peace and unity, but you have to as an institution. But you cannot take political sides, you cannot take individual sides. If you have somebody standing for justice, of course you stand by him. And you ask your students to stand by him. But you will also have to face the consequences, you'll have to be ready for it. Yes. Yes. Hello, sir. So, but I asked about policy. Administrator to run an institution. As an administrator, you need to be very diplomatic. Tomorrow, if I start yes. supporting one party, my students will ask, what is this institution for? If I start supporting Mr. A, because he is into something else, no. The institution has to be impartial. It should have a policy that is propagating humanity. An institution should stand for values, not for any particular party, particular group, particular individual. No. no I do agree with you, but yes. what I want to know or I wish to say that... Uh, and the uh, behind the bars is one of them with Father Stan the Swami. Like okay. sir? Yes. No, no, it's the same, same group. Father Stan Lourdes Swami was also accused in the same case. Uh, not who died. <laughs> Sir, it is a fundamental right to... No, no, uh, I'm not asking the bias in a group. No, 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 no. <laughs> we are not here to argue because I cannot let the students to go in one side and then the professors to go another side. You need to be an administrator, look into the issues. Yes, sir. And then judge on the moment what is right, what is wrong. No, but I'm referring to the case that you referred to. Yes, yes. I cannot support an activist like that as an institution. Because the very fact I do it, let me tell you very plainly, we, no university will do it. Though of yes, course... I, there is. There is. I can refer the university in okay, okay. European country. Europe, I'm not talking about European country. I'm talking about Indian country. I'm talking so about India. Them, it's an Indian case. It's an Indian case. You can stand, you can support as an individual. I can support as an individual, not as an institution. I have no responsibility to put an institution under risk as a leader of the institution. I have to be very careful. That you have to keep it in mind, number one. Number two, Father Stan Lourdes Swami was also one of the victims of this case. And we stood by him. We had procession. Not as a university takes out a procession because it will be labeled. You see, but there are students who took up the case. There are individual professors who took up the case, individual citizens of the city who took up the case, there were processions, number of processions. We raised our voice, definitely I was there, even I was there. And so, if you want to do it, you do it, but be ready to face the consequence. This is where my point is. If you are not ready to face the consequence, you cannot do it. That will be the Yes, that's it. Thank you. In fact, uh, Father would be available during lunch. Uh, celebrates the birthday of Jesus. I specifically myself, I belong to, I mean, Hinduism, but of Ramakrishna order, because I was schooled there. 
if you see the streets of Kolkata on 25th of December, millions of Hindus, they visit churches and they offer their puja and they offer their prayer to Jesus. In Ramakrishna Mission, even in Belur Mat, they call it Jishu Puja, which happens on 25th of December. So the way the religions were theorized and the way the religions are practiced now, I think there is a lot of difference. The way we used to understand and you know uh, feel a religion 100 years back and the way we practice the religion today, there is a lot of difference. So we, I mean the Hinduism has internalized to some extent the Christianity because on 25th December remains as a festival of all. So the question further which remains in my mind till today, a lot of things uh, have been spoken about the conflict between the Catholicism and the Hinduism, but the question that remains in my mind today is, where is the conflict further? Where is the conflict? I did not feel it. Experience is any conflict. Uh, it's here. The conflict is here. It's man-made. So I don't think scripturally, theologically, philosophically, uh, there are conflicts. We'll have to find ways and means of syncretization. You know, unifying factors that bring us together. Conflicts emerge if you want conflicts to merge. This is what is happening. I don't see any conflicts, number one. Uh, number two, of course, you know the history of Ramakrishna mission. You know the life of uh, Ramakrishna. You know the life of Swami Vivekananda. They have sufficient reasons from their own experience to have that significant celebration on 24th and 25th, wherein we are invited to share that celebration of Christmas in their months. And this continues. Christians as well as the monks of Ramakrishna mission, as well as the disciples of Ramakrishna mission joined together and celebrated in various places. It's also in Gold Park. I've attended two, three times there. And so we are invited to celebrate Christmas with them. And these are the meeting points wherein we meet and appreciate one another that we have both, in both religions, the richness which we need to appreciate. Uh, maybe I can share with you, especially to the friends of Bishavarati, uh, we have introduced what you call a foundation course at St. Xavier's College and St. Xavier's University. Two credit course. One credit is for religious studies and the other is for personality development. Now, personality development is for the student to develop himself so that he faces the real world. The first religious studies is every student who joins St. Xavier's has to go through for that one credit 15 lectures of learning the basic essence of every religion. So that after three years when he leaves the portals of the institution he doesn't leave with any hatred, dislikeness to any religion but leaves with appreciation of all religions, including other religions than his faith. This is what is the approach, and that's what we are doing, and we have made it mandatory. Every student who joins St. Xavier's, either the college or the university, has to go through these two courses, two credit courses. And these two credit courses after completion, it has exams. After completion, they will be mentioned in the mark sheet. If you don't complete, you don't receive your mark sheet. That's the effort that we have made to bring in certain amount of understanding of all religions and their richness. Thank you very much. That's I think I leave it, I give it to the MC, sir. Thank you.